podcast world what's up chat belly back at you another episode of this life ain't for everybody we got another dandy for you today today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at oakley oakley eyewear protect your vision believe in the oakley culture from baseball to biking to surfing to hunting to shooting to ballistic to our military to tactical eyewear oakley is there for us they were started with the mission of making sure that everybody kept their vision throughout their entire lifetime, and that's what they continue to do within the old Oakley culture. We're proud to be associated with them. Thank you for supporting the partners and sponsors that support the podcast and our TV shows. We have a professional athlete on the podcast today, an episode that's going to be full of baseball terminology, baseball jargon, if you will. Jed Jorko, you have made a name for yourself as... What, how would you explain it? Would you consider yourself a blue chipper Pete Rose style player or how would people define you right now at this phase of your baseball game? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, I wish I could uh, say I was anything close to Pete Rose, but uh, you know, I'm just, uh, just hanging on, man. Just trying to get through, you know, one year at a time, uh, just going out and playing. I got in here by busting my butt. It's the only way I know how to do it. So, uh, I work for all that hard work. I definitely wouldn't be here. I'm not the uh, definitely not the biggest, fastest, strongest guy out there. So uh, I got to make up for it with some some hard work and get dirty. Well, welcome to the podcast, man. We appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good time. Milwaukee Milwaukee Brewers. Do you would you have had a starting role if we would not be going to through what we're going through currently? Uh, I'm not sure. We were we were like just at that point in spring training where you kind of start to figure out what the team's going to look like, kind of what your role is going to be. And then, I mean, all of a sudden you're we're all sent home. We're, we're all driving, flying home. Um, so it's kind of it was kind of to be determined that we were starting to figure out some stuff and what the team was going to look like. And then, uh, yeah, all this stuff's happened. So it's uh, it's definitely been definitely been a little weird, been uh, definitely a season like uh, none of us have ever seen before. And this would have been your first year in Milwaukee, right? Yeah, I was, I mean, just just starting to learn some of the guys' names and uh, then getting shipped out. So uh, we're, uh, we're all eager to get back to, to meeting up with each other and hopefully getting this thing underway. Did you uh, develop any French? Is, is Kane a nice guy? I got to meet Kane when he was with Kansas City. Is Moose still with – is he with Cincinnati now or is he with Milwaukee? Did he re-sign with Milwaukee? Yeah, he, uh, he just signed with Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Um, Kane's awesome. I haven't, I haven't really talked to him too much just from playing back and forth. Um, I knew Yelich a little bit and he's, I mean, he's an awesome dude. So, uh, a lot of the, a lot of new guys on the team, uh, even from their team last year, we, they brought in a bunch of new guys. So we were all kind of, uh, in the same boat, just trying to get to trying to feel each other out and, uh, figure out, uh, you know, who we're going to be hanging out with. What is the secret, Jed? What is the secret sauce of being a baller, a major leaguer, not just getting to the show, but staying in the show, whether you're a utility player, whether you come off the bench, whether you're a starter, whether you're a, you know, a a 15 year veteran that made the all-star team 12 out of 15 seasons. What did you have? You talked about it in the beginning of our conversation about, you know, the work ethic is there. Were you in little league? Were you a standout when you got to Babe Ruth? Were you a standout when you were a freshman in high school? Did you make the varsity team and then got all league? Were you first team all league? Were you honorable mention? Were you all state? Were you all division? Were you, have you been a badass your entire career or did you have to just keep driving and grinding and grinding to get to where you are right now? Um, yeah, I was, I was always one of the better players for sure. Definitely like in little league, made the varsity team as a freshman, uh, was able to, to be all state all four years and then went to here at WBU and was, it was able to be an all American three years in a row. So, uh, I've always, I've always take pride in trying to be the best. That's definitely, uh, something that my dad's always, uh, instilled in me is to, if I'm going to go out there, I'm going to try to win, I'm gonna try to do my best. And, um, no, I don't. I don't think there's really a, a magic formula or magic sauce, nothing like that. It's just you got to get out there, you got to grind it every single day. Uh, obviously, we're talent-wise, we're the best of the best. But I think it, when it gets to this stage and the players are so good, it starts. Uh, it's when it really starts getting mental. Uh, the season is so long. How can you deal with those failures? How can you deal with being away from your family, all the travel, just stuff like that's really what separates guys from you know getting a little taste in the big leagues or guys that stick around for a while. So you sign with WVU out of high school. Are you getting recruited by several Division One outfits at this time? Are you? Did you take all five of your recruiting trips? 
No, I, uh, I, I got recruited a good bit, but I, I only went on one visit. I actually went to uh, up to St. John's. I knew one of their assistant coaches really well. Um, went up there, went for my visit, did the whole the whole thing. And uh, that's when I was up there, I realized that it's just, it's just not home. And uh, that's kind of when I made my decision. I didn't even go on another visit. Uh, I pretty much signed with signed with West Virginia after that visit and knew that, uh, you know, staying at home and being with my family is something I wanted to do. And when you say family, are you talking about your, your, your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters, or are you married already and you had kids at a younger age or what, what, uh, what made you make that decision? Um, that was at that point, it was to, you know, stay home with my mom and dad, uh, two, two older brothers, one that actually played football at West Virginia. So I think that, that definitely played a factor in too, just to see the tradition and be able to watch him go through college and be able to stay here. Uh, that played a big role. And that now um, Mary now uh, got a couple kids and uh, living it up. How'd you meet your wife? Give me the story. Was she uh, I, I was reading this thing the other day on the athletic or something where the on deck circle was where the eye contact was made from to like the fourth <laughs> row. And there was, you know, like, a, you know, the glimpse was caught. The eye contact was made. And then, the, you know, running up the stairs after the game was over to say hello. And four years later, they're married. Was it a yeah, baseball I'm- story written like that? No, I, I didn't. I didn't put my number on a ball and throw it to her in the stands. It wasn't wasn't quite that good. But uh, you know, we we actually went to elementary school together. We've known each other forever. Um, didn't didn't start dating till college, and uh, now we got married. It'll be it'll be nine years in November. We've got uh, three little kids, and um, like I said, we're just just living life. What are the kids, boys and you got a mixture, boys and girls? Yeah, twin, twin six year old boys right out of the gate, and then uh, little girls will be three tomorrow, so uh, they're starting to grow up. And what year did you come out of West Virginia? It was it, you've been in the sh- you've been in the show for about seven years now, yeah, seven years. I got I got drafted in uh 2010 after my junior year, after your junior year, 2010. So you're in your you're probably right now in your like low 30s. Yeah, thirty-one. I'll be uh, thirty-two at the end of end of this year. And what kind of what kind of um, it feeling is there wrapped around your name now? You stay in your home state. You're at WVU. You play all three years there, which is mandatory when you sign a D one contract before you're eligible for the Major League Baseball draft. When you're going into the 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 June time frame, the College World Series is going on. The draft's getting ready to happen. Are cross checkers calling you left and right? Are you getting heavily? Uh, talk to is your agent calling you saying hey be prepared for this round they're talking about you tell me how it lays down and what the ending result was that day and how you celebrated it what the phone call said who was with you yeah it was uh that's exactly pretty much how it goes down you're playing the whole spring season and uh you know west virginia it's still pretty cold when the baseball season's going on and we were at they have a new awesome stadium now where people actually go to but back when i was there there would be about 15 fans watching us play out in the snow and 12 of them were my family. So that was, uh, that was kind of interesting, but, um, and then you see a random scout here and there, and then, uh, did a couple uh, pre-draft workouts is what, what happens. Um, kind of go around, showcase yourself. And then, uh, I had an advisor. You can't call him an agent then because they can't represent you because the NCAA, but, uh, so you have an advisor, uh, the teams are pretty much contacting him. They're relaying the information. Uh, they were saying, you know, late first round possibility, but probably into the second round at some point. And that's pretty much what happened. Went uh, ninth overall in the second round. Uh, I think 59th overall out to, uh, out to San Diego. And about a week later, I was on a, on a plane, plane out to uh, start playing. Now, do we have a mutual friend from your Padres days and Andrew Kashner? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I played, yeah, we played a couple of years together. We've, uh, I know cash pretty well. Cash came out of uh, came out of Texas. He went to he was drafted both year or out of high school his senior year, both years out of a junior college. Then he went, ended up going to TCU, I believe, and getting drafted as a junior there. Uh, I think to the Cubs originally yep. to Chicago. Um, yep. He's a, I hunt with Cashner. I've, he's been on our TV show a few times, and we we've worked with with him on uh, some d- different businesses. And he's taking the year off though. He had a baby, and I heard he's taking the year off this year. Yeah, that's which uh, I guess uh, all of you are. Yeah, we might all be taking a year off the way it's going, but uh, we'll see. But uh, yeah, Cash is. Uh, it seems crazy that he's got a kid now. He, um, I, I vividly remember walking into the clubhouse just about every day to to hearing him blowing duck calls throughout the uh, the clubhouse. So that was uh, that was pretty much my first taste of duck hunting right there. 
Yeah, six foot five dude with a mullet blowing a duck call and listen <laughs> yeah. to Eminem rap songs. And yeah, exactly. wearing cowboy the, boots and rank. Like he's yeah, he's the most a stud. ghetto redneck ever. Yeah, I was down there on a. I don't know what year it would have been. Pro, you were there, but it was probably if it's 2020 now, it might have been 14 or 15. He was the f- opening day pitcher at at a Jack. Is it Jack Murphy? Back in the day, uh, it was right. Uh, no, no it's not, not Jack, Jack Murphy. Murphy anymore. What was it now? Sitco? I don't even know what it is now. Petco. 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 Yep. He was the opening day starter. The military came out and they flew the jets over the field and cash was on the bump with his mullet. And we were up in the president's <laughs> box watching him. And he was a, it was a, it was awesome to see him. And then I think he went to Miami from there and then he went to Boston for a minute maybe. And then he was, yeah, with he's the, kind of been bounced around in Baltimore. So Baltimore, he's, he's yeah. bounced around here recently. Yeah. 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 He, man, and then he, the Rangers, he, right? He was with the Rangers last. He, yeah, he's kind of just, he's been around recently. He's a uh, man, he's an awesome dude. Just a guy that uh, kind of like myself, just kind of got after it and loved to get out there and compete. So what hap- What happens when you, these scouts are checking you out? If you had a piece of paper that was handed to you and it had the five tools of baseball on there, I want to get into what those tools are, Jed, and what would what w- does a junior in high school right now, a senior in high school right now look at to, to work on it's it's you got to love the game you have to have passion for the game you're not going to be the best all the time you can be a big fish in a little pond in high school and then go to d1 or even a junior college and just see talent that you that you're just not expected right because you didn't see it in your hometown um those five tools are arm strength speed bat speed and overall batting intelligence of the game and fielding uh yeah Power, power, the the hit tool, which would be like the overall hitting power, speed, uh, arm strength, and yeah, fielding. So, it is, and what about baseball IQ and intelligence of the game? Do they look at that, no, or is that something that can be taught? That's uh, you can you kind of have it or not, but you can you can get taught a little bit. But you just kind of have to have those instincts when you're out on the field, and you can see guys that that have it and don't. But uh, you know, those younger kids, you're unless you're Mike Trout or something like that, you're gonna you're going to run into guys that are better than you and you have to find a way to separate yourself. And that's, uh, you know, that's an important thing. Like you said, the IQ can be something that separates you, your, uh, your competitiveness, you're willing to just not lose uh, all that stuff plays into it. You just got to get after it. You, I played with guys all through college and the minors that were way better baseball players than I was, but they just didn't, they either didn't have their priorities straight. They got into stuff they shouldn't have been doing. And, and just like that, there's so many good players out there that, uh, one missed up like that can derail in someone's entire career. And what, what were those tools? What did that sheet of paper say for you? Um, I was mostly, uh, I was pretty average. I was below average runner. I'm probably even more below average runner now than I was then, but uh, I had a good hit tool, pretty good power. And other than that, just pretty average across the board. Just nothing that really stood out. It wasn't particularly great at anything, but I wasn't really bad at anything either. Um, I think I had the in- intangibles. The uh, everyone's ever met me said I'm the most competitive person they've ever met. So that's something that uh, has always been on my side. Yeah, but Jed, I, if you came here right now, I would whip your ass in ping pong. That is my attitude, right? Like I'm as competitive as they come. But you can't sit here and tell me that you're going in the second round and just be average across <laughs> the board. You got to be standing out in some areas besides an okay hit tool. Like arm strength is your glove. Are you a gold glove infielder? Are you? I, I mean, can you run the ball down in the infield gap and 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 still make an athletic play, dive and get up on your feet? Are you that kind of athlete? Like, tell me, like, what did you have? that these scouts were like we're not going to wait until even through the whole third second round this guy's going top 60 picks in the country which i think there's what 40 rounds of the major league baseball draft 30 teams 30 times 40 is what 1200 players go yeah. you're in the top 60 in the country and you're talking every high school senior every every freshman in junior college sophomore in junior college and junior in d1 or d2 or d3 baseball you're in the top 60 in the, in the, in the, in the, in the draft. Like that is legit. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just talking about probably throughout the big leagues, but back then, you know, my hit tool is what really carried me. Um, you know, I, my stats or whatever were, re- were really good. I was always known as, you know, a hitter first um, that, that they all, all the scouts knew that I played other sports too. So they knew that I was a little, a little more athletic than what I looked was able to move, had good feet, good arm actions. Uh, which means it's just strong arm, accurate arm. And you definitely would not beat me in ping pong. Really? 
No, no. So chance. you got really good eye hand coordination. What kind of paddle do you have? Do you have a Stiga or are you, are you, what kind of, are oh, you a butterfly matter. guy? It doesn't matter. It, You're going to, it gonna... doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh we, my gosh. We played, you got to, uh, we played a bunch in the, when I was in St. Louis in the clubhouse was a, a, a table and I pretty much ran that table. So, uh, I, I think I have you. Did you play Wainwright? Yeah, I did play Wainwright. I beat him. Did but you he, play he was pretty good. He's pretty good. Yeah, I, I've uh, I've been around Adam. He's a big hunter, and he's a he's a he's a great athlete. Uh, Bush Stadium, probably the best baseball fans that you've ever ran across. St. Louis as a whole is the culture of baseball there. The the fans, the intelligence, and the respect of the game of the fans, the 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 logistics and the aesthetics of Bush Stadium now with the natural grass after the turf came out. It's got to be probably the best baseball culture in the country. Even though Miller Park and Bob Euchre and the history of the Brewers and the beer and the breweries up there is pretty pretty legit st louis has got to be tops yeah uh st louis is really good I, i'm not gonna say they're tops because obviously i'm now in milwaukee so according to me now i think milwaukee's got the best fans but uh st louis was definitely good yeah they're uh you know they understand the game they're appreciative they show up regardless whether you're winning or losing which they for the most part do a lot of winning so uh there's people who are there they got your backs no matter what and uh but uh, like i said I'm, I'm really excited to play in milwaukee they Every time I've gone there, the stadium has been packed. It gets loud. It gets wild. So I'm looking forward to hopefully having some fans in the stands if uh, if that uh, is what we can get to. What is it? What is being said right now? Let's get to that real quick and, and then off of it real quick because it seems like every conversation you're probably involved in right now centers around that, and I don't want to bog you down. But I've heard rumors and ramblings that mid-July with no fans in the stadium that y'all might be back. You might do a 15-day spring training leading into that. Is there any – truth to those rumors and what are you hearing right now um we're just we're pretty much hearing what's out on twitter you know we talk as a union uh we're talking a bunch and um, obviously the proposals that just came out about the whole economic thing and all that stuff is we're hoping that we can get all that figured out um I, to my my guess i have no idea how long the, the schedule is going to be but uh i think most importantly we got to make sure everyone's safe i think that's the the most important thing. I think we can figure out the money at some point, but until the protocols and everyone is guaranteed to be safe, uh, I don't think anything's going to happen until that can be guaranteed. So there's no, do you think there's any chance that you'll see a live pitch in July, um, 45 um, days from now? If I had a guess, if it was just me guessing, I would say the season has got to start in July. Um, I feel like we just wouldn't be able to get enough games in. Uh, I don't think it would be, just doesn't seem like it would make sense because you can't play baseball the entire year into December, January and stuff like that to get enough games to make the season even worth it. So I think we, we would probably have to start sometime in July. Sometime in July. So now when you're, when you're coming out of West Virginia, do you, you get drafted to San Diego? Do they send you straight to winter ball or I mean, rookie ball at that time in June, July, do you go straight out to Arizona? I went, uh, I went straight to the short season team, which was in Eugene, Oregon. So I went, uh, I mean, the draft, let's say the draft was, I got drafted on Saturday. I would say by Thursday or Friday, I was already on a plane out to, uh, out to Eugene, did my physical, signed my contract and was playing by Sunday or Monday. So it, it happens pretty quick. Wow. What a freaking deal to be like going, like you, you go from, how you described it of 15 people in the stands in a colder environment in West Virginia to getting picked in the top 60 players in the country, number nine overall in the second round of the major league baseball draft. Now you're in Eugene origin for, or in, for the rookie ball short season in Oregon. Are you, is there an adjustment period? Had you been to the Alaska lead? Have you played in the Cape Cod to where you had some experience with a wood bat or did you have yeah, to get played, right on the wood right then? No, I play, I played in the, uh, I played in the, at the Cape the summer before my junior year. So I went, I went up there and played and got to swing the wind bat a little bit. And then, uh, that was definitely, a, definitely an adjustment. And more than anything, you did, you pretty much go up there and you're facing every team's, every college's best pitchers, the guy you're facing every single night. Uh, so that's an adjustment just to, to try to figure out the competition, uh, see if you can stack up. And how'd you do up in the Cape? Uh, I did well, did well at the Cape, went, uh, went up there, Made was able to uh, you know play in the All Star game. Made the All Tournament team. Um, played well. I think that really was the 
a springboard to, to get me a lot of scouts to look at me. Uh, there's scouts running around crazy up there watching every single game. And if you can play well up there, uh, you're setting yourself up, setting yourself up to go pretty high in draft. Back to this ping pong deal real quick. Now that you got me brewing a little bit, do you play by all of the regulatory rules and regulations of the ping, the Olympic ping pong committee, Jed Jorko? And do you drop serve and just hide it in your hand or do you actually toss and show the ball? Are uh, you playing by all the rules and, and are you a defensive player? Am I going to back you off the table? Um, or do you stay right up on it? What's your style? No, I, you got to show the ball when you serve. None of this spinning serve stuff. And, uh, and I'm more I'm more of a spin guy. I, I'll use the power if I have to, but I, I my go to shots the backhand backhand slice just to uh, see if you got any touch and feel. How how do we solve this? Because I really think I could take you. I'm a lefty. I got a wicked backhand, a pretty strong forehand. I got quick feet. I can back up, come forward pretty quick. Okay. Uh, um, we need to solve it. We need to figure this out. Maybe do a little uh, a game for charity or something, and send all the money to Ronald McDonald House or your. If you win your charity of choice, if I win my charity okay. of choice. Yeah, I'm in for sure. You let me know when and where. I'll be there. I think we ought to do it. Now, are you an outdoorsman at all? Yes, I, I love love being out, love being outside. I love hunting, love fishing. Uh, pretty much, that's uh, that's what I live for. Well, then let's plan it to where, uh, depending on your season, the World Series is still going to have to get over sometime in late October, early November at the latest. I'd imagine you you plan on flying in to Sacramento. You're you've been to California, and I'll handle okay. everything from there, and I'll have the table set up. I'll have everything and um i'll give you a couple days to warm up and get acclimated to the new time zone and everything and then (laughs) (laughs) and being at sea level again and then we'll go at it yeah i i like sacramento i've been out there a few times uh when i was in triple a it's uh i don't mind it i'll I'll go up i'll go up there and uh put a whooping on you oh i don't know if that's gonna happen dude. (laughs) i when when you were going to sacramento were they giant were they the giants then or were they yeah yeah were they the giants they yeah, uh, I think they I got was a, in that the river cat, in, the river cats. Yeah, I was in that league in uh, 2012. So it's it's been it's been a minute. I think they've got different teams up there now. So here's where I'm going with this 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 uh, smack talking on this ping pong deal, Jed. I was in. I've told this story before, but I was in Argentina last year hunting ducks down in in by Buenos Aires, and I had some guys from Benelli there, our shotgun sponsor. And there we were sitting around eating after the morning duck hunt. And I just made a remark, you know, I just spouted off and I said, baseball players are the best all around athletes in the world, hands down. And they looked at me and George literally spit his food out of his mouth and told me I was an idiot. And he told me soccer players are way better athletes. And then JP was like, yeah, they got to keep running and all this stuff. So I went into this little analogy, Jed, about if you took, Jed Jorko, if you took you and let's say Kane and Kane didn't even start playing baseball. I don't think until like his senior year in high school or something, it was something, some, some, something in that time period. All I was simply was saying, and you tell me your opinion, Jed is you take the top athlete or one of the top players off of every major league team. You do the same in NFL, the swim clubs and the Olympic swim committee, the NBA, the NHL, the bowling association and you put them in an Olympic style athletic event competition to wear ping pong, bowling, dribbling a basketball and doing a layup, shooting a three pointer, swinging a bat and hitting a ball, taking a ground ball, fielding a, 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 an outfield, the fly ball with depth perception, catching a pass, throwing a football, swimming across the pool. I'm going to take the baseball players as the guys that go in and perform to the ma- like the mastery of each of those drills, each of those competitions, I'm going to take baseball guys of being able to swim, of being able to catch a pass, of being able to dribble and do a layup, hit a ping pong paddle and the ball back and forth and rally and spike it and backhand and all that. And not even getting that complicated, just an all out Olympic style deal to where every athlete has to pl- show their skills in each event. What professional athlete athlete comes out on top in your opinion? Oh, baseball for sure. Without question. Am I not right on that? Is without being arrogant, is that not an easy deal? Like I love what Michael Jordan can do with a basketball, but it didn't look so good when he was in Birmingham and not to take anything away from what he did for that club and that organization baseball. I'm just simply saying not everybody could do what Bo Jackson did. You know, he could hit a bomb in the All-Star right. game, run a, run Brian Bosworth over, win the, the, the slam dunk contest with Foot Locker, 
but not everybody's like him or Dion, right? If you take it as an average and you just take each top athlete off of the baseball teams, they're going to beat the football players because the football player is not going to go in and swing a bat like you do. But you could go in and catch a pass or throw a ball, not as good as Brady, but you could get it done. Does that make sense? Yeah, they, there's a saying out there that says you put a baseball player in any other sport and they'll compete, but you put a, another athlete in the batter's box and they'll have no chance. No chance. No chance. And no. not just on top of, of hitting a round object with another round object from 60 feet, six inches, changing planes, changing speeds, like a 97 mile an hour fastball to the same arm speed with an 83 mile an hour changeup is like impossible, right? Like <laughs> just to be able to see that in the change of the plane and, and not be able to see any difference in the arm delivery or the arm speed and to be able to put that ball in play, unreal. Then you got to go to the ground ball. You have to be... And then you got to go to the mentality of 162 game season, the grind of that. Then there's the readiness. If you're a third baseman and the ball's getting hit to the right side of the infield all day, you still got to be ready every pitch. Same in the outfield. And then all of a sudden you got to react and use your drop step or what or, or side shuffle to get in position when you might not have seen any action for the last six, 60 pitches or whatever. So I'm simply sitting there in Argentina going, you guys are going to tell me that Pele is a better athlete than Mike Trout. You think he could come up here and hit a golf ball over the moon and then swim laps like that and then play hacky sack and do that kind of stuff there's just and then and then play against jed and ping pong and get smoked he's not going to perform in all of this stuff i just don't think uh, there is i really don't uh, i agree with you i think that uh you know baseball players are we're multi-dimensional we're we're athletes we compete uh we got that grind we'll, we'll we just we just try to we find ways to win that's that's what we do and but the the talent part of it, I truly feel that a baseball player is going to outshine. Just on the talent portion of it, you're going to see better form and better ability, better technique. I bet you, if I put you in a pool right now, you could look like an Olympic swimmer. Maybe not as fast. You couldn't beat Phelps. We're not saying that, but you can swim and not look like you're doggy paddling or drowning or getting eaten by a shark. I think I would stay off the bottom of the pool. I don't, I'm not sure how fast it would be, but I don't think they would have to throw the floaty in to get me. That's what I'm saying. And, and I just, I've always said that every baseball player that I've ever been around can step in and do that stuff and, 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 and make it look pretty normal. Like they, they've been there, done that. And ping pong, the reason I asked you that question that came up in my mind was ping pong is a game of minuscule measurements of you know, that ball misses going over the net by a little bit. And let's say it just clears the net by a half a centimeter. And you, at the other hand, have to have the eye hand coordination and the mental capacity to figure out what's the spin on it. Where is it going to hit on the table and how am I going to get my paddle on it? And then what am I going to do to my paddle to get it at the right angle to get it back over the net and give that guy less of, or, or girl a less of a chance to return it back on me and score on me. Like that's a great game of eye hand coordination and skill and determination and not to mention heart rates up and you're bouncing around and shuffling and back and forth like i think baseball players beat football players swimmers like 100 percent of the time in ping pong for sure yeah it's well i mean hand-eye coordination is is huge in uh in baseball obviously just trying to put the bat on the ball but uh yeah that, i mean there's all those things play right into kind of right into our hands as, as baseball players that's those are the the skills that we possess and we're good at it so without ever seeing me play ping pong, how much money would you put up for charity on a bet if you're a betting man and we're in Nevada where I'm at, which is a betting state, a casino state. I'm in Reno, Tahoe, but same rules as Vegas, same laws apply. How much are you willing to put up blind without ever seeing me play, knowing that I'm not a major leaguer, that I played a little bit of D1 baseball and I was average talking? at best. And my coach told me in D1 baseball, my coach at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Jed, told me, Belding, you're the biggest recruiting mistake that I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking down your game a little bit now. It's, it's going down a little bit. But uh, I'd, let you, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe let you pick. Really? I'd, I'd be up for anything. Really? Yeah, hey, I, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid to throw a, throw a bet out there a time or two. Uh, I'll... Uh, I'll go for it. So you would put your entire salary on the line? Probably not. Probably not. But okay, uh, you're, you're not going to do that. Yeah, I don't, uh, maybe not that much. But uh, is it I'll, a one? I'd throw something out there. Is it a one gamer? Or is it best out of three or five? Or what do uh, we do? What, hey, whatever you want. I, I like best three, best out of three, best out of five. You, you can maybe get a flute game in there. 
All right, so we have a mutual friend and a guy named Marlon the Winter that's an absolute genius when it comes to public relations. He introduced me to you. He's been lighting the world on fire for myself and our brands. He's part of what they call, and, and I saw you communicating a little bit on the Cornhole Association of America. I would say that I would beat you by probably the same amount of points in Cornhole than I would in ping, as I would in ping pong. Would you take that bet too? Or are you a badass cornhole player too? Yeah, I don't. I don't think you beat me in either. <laughs> are you, dude? I got cornhole right out here. I was just playing. I got. I everyone is seeing my basement now because of this cornhole trick shot stuff. So uh, my my boards are always set up. Maybe like a, a a home and home series, something like that. I fly out there, but you then you got to come back here to Morgantown, West Virginia, and play cornhole. I would do it in a heartbeat. I would come back there. We would go to the beach. We would probably no. maybe go, maybe no beach around there. We'd have to go <laughs> no. down to, we'd have to go down to VB for that. Yeah. Yeah. We're not, not super close to the beach. No, you guys are in West. So you're in West Virginia. So you're ways from it. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a little bit, we're up, uh, up in the mountains a little bit. Are you a fan of the Chesapeake Bay and the Maryland and the seafood and the crabs and the rockfish and all of that kind of table fare? Um, I love eating it. That's, uh, that's still a little ways from me. That's probably like, I don't know, five or six hours from where I live. So it's, uh, you're not just going to drive over there to, to grab some, some crab legs and crab cakes and then drive back. But, uh, anytime I'm over there, uh, I got one of my best buddies who lives out there kind of close. So I'll go and visit him and we'll go and, uh, you know, we'll crush some food out there. If you're, if you are in San Diego back in your playing days with the Padres, are you a street taco guy or are you a sushi guy or are you a crab and steak guy? Cause there's a lot of good food in San Diego. All the above, all the above kind of guy out there. That food is unbelievable. Unreal. How good it is, man. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's a, that's a great city. You, I mean, everyone talks about it and everything they say is pretty much true. It's, it's unbelievable out there. My buddy Reef had a place called Sushi 7 that I took uh, cash and, oh man, tell me the third baseman's name that went to New York Yankees from Headley. the Padres. Chase. Chase yeah. and I and Cash went to Sushi 7 in the gas lamp um, and we threw down one night after a home series game there. What, if, if you're sitting at a sushi restaurant and the waiter comes up and says, Jed, how you been, bro? What can I get you? What do you throw down with on a sushi? Are you a roll guy? Please yeah. tell me that you're not a fried shrimp and cream cheese guy. Are you all raw? Uh, How do you roll? No, I would just get some kind of uh, probably like a spicy, spicy tuna, spicy salmon roll. Uh, to, I'd tell the uh, the chef in the back just to make me something what he recommends. I, I'm, I'm big on just leaving it up to the chef. Can't go wrong if you leave it up to them. And I think that that's a great point, Jed, because sushi is one of the the most relationship geared meals, in my opinion, to where if you're a mainstay, a familiar face at that sushi bar, you can do what you just described. Like, you'd be like, hey, hit me up with something special. And they go back and come up with some wizardy and they cut wizard oh, yeah. stuff and they come out and you're just like, whoa, that's like there's barely any rice in it. And it's like tuna wrapped around some yellowtail with this and with a scallop on the inside. And uh, they can. Yeah, I love those to, kind of relationships. We used to crush sushi on the rocks out there. It's in La Jolla and it's. I mean, it is so good. And uh, I got to know, I got to know the owner a little bit out there and we would go and he'd, he'd come into the clubhouse, you know, probably once a week or so and cook us all food. And I would just kind of give him the nod and he knew what the nod meant. That means he was just going to take care of us and uh, bring out, bring out whatever he makes. Have you ever been to an all you can eat place? Uh, I have been to them before. Yes. Have you been to, um, have you see, so our, our triple a team here, would have started in seven. Did you ever play in Reno against the Diamondbacks organization against the Reno yeah. Aces? Yeah, so you, and that was uh, I played against all those teams, and uh, it would have been twenty twelve. So yeah, I, I've seen. I was there watching. I, I I actually threw out the first pitch in twenty twelve and got to take BP. Um, on, do we filmed a TV episode over there with the starting catcher that was um, for the Reno Aces? Does the name Conrad Schmidt ring a bell at all to you? He played for Arizona no. and Texas in the big leagues for a little while. No, I don't, I don't think I recognize that name. He's a big hunter, and we uh, we did a little media blitz with him for TV, and I got to take BP and and then uh, and then do throw out the first pitch. And throwing out the first pitch was more nerve-wracking than the BP. I could see why, like, Baba Booey and some of these celebrities, like 50 Cent, yeah. like, absolutely <laughs> just dogwood it when they get up their chance to do it. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's nerve wracking. I only I only did it one time. I went back to for some reason I was back here. The local little league was opening up. They wanted me to throw out the first pitch, and they had like I'm not kidding a six year old kid catching the ball when I threw it into, and I was so nervous that I was going to hit that kid right in the face that I like threw it like 40 feet in the air just so I could throw it as easy as I could. <laughs> yeah, you didn't want to put up with mom if something happened, huh? Yeah, I was, Throw out the first pitch and they'll get sued for a dentist trip or something. Yeah, freaking molar got knocked out. <laughs> so when you when you start talking about the cities that you get to travel to, you're you're in the you you were in the National League for a long time. You're still you still travel to lots of major league cities and major league stadiums. Is there is there a certain favorite? of anything that comes off the top of your head do you do you get off on any of the nostalgia the history of the game in certain areas do you like being on ocean side places to where you can when you're if you got a, a an afternoon you can go out you know if it's a day game you get an evening sit out on a dock on the ocean does anything stand out do you like playing in miami is that stadium even worth being in do you like do you what where do you like being the most no, Miami is not near the top. That uh, that's not my scene. It's too hot. The stadium is. It's, we're pretty much fish in an aquarium, is what I feel like. But uh, I'm an outdoors guy, so I really like going to Denver. Um, one one year we went up there and went up to Bailey and caught a bunch of fish out on on the river, which was awesome. So I mean, I love going to Seattle too. Just uh, I just like being outside, kind of breathing in the air, checking it out, uh, checking out nature, really. Speaking of Denver and speaking of fishing, what do you think of the man they call Chuck Nasty? Are you a Charlie Blackman fan? Um, he's been on the podcast. I love Charlie. He loves fly fishing and duck hunting. He just got a new Labrador Retriever, Black Lab puppy, and um, great dude. Are you a fan of Chuck Nasty? Yeah, I respect the heck out of him. We we actually have we have the same agents. So uh, he he just switched over to the agency that I've been with my whole career, and. Uh, Obviously, you know, his play is it speaks for itself, but uh, a little jealous of that beard. I would never be able to pull anything close to that off, nor would I want to. But uh, I'm sure there's definitely some stuff hidden in that thing somewhere. Oh, I guarantee it. What makes him special? Is it his is it is it the tenacity or is he got God given talent? Um, he's got he's got both. You know, he just to, to be able to go out and do what he does, be a pretty much an all star every year, hit three hundred, hit thirty homers. Uh, he's just a freak. He's a freak on the field, and uh, it's just a lot of fun watching him play. Yeah, he's a he had a bomb last year in the all star game. Do you remember that? Yeah, he's uh, he's a stud, no doubt about it. He does, and he's like you know he's when you talk to him, you're just like he's so much different off the field than he is on the field, which I know a lot of players are, but he's got like this, just like totally different personality when he's like just chilling, you know, like you're, the and I'm sure you're the same way. I don't, are you approachable on the field? Yeah. Alter ego. That's what we talked about in our podcast is this Chuck nasty alter ego, like this Chuck Norris kind of don't mess with me kind of deal. You know, like he even said like reporters don't even walk up to him most of the time. Well, I think they're just intimidated because of the beard more than anything. But uh, maybe I'll grow, try to grow that thing out so the reporters stay away a little bit. Yeah, maybe you ought to. Are you are you a uh, are you a Netflix and chill binge watching? I know you got to stay in shape. I know that you have to watch your nutrition and your diet. You're in your 30s now. Is your metabolism the same as it was when you were in your 20s? But can you eat whatever you want still? Are you a fanatic when it comes to working out every day? Have you been able to stay disciplined during the pandemic and the quarantine? And when you're not working out and you're not eating, or let's say you are eating some China takeout or some sushi takeout or some homemade sushi, whatever you have, you and your wife are chilling. Are you watching documentaries? Are you watching movies? Or do you have to watch kids shows all the time yeah, now? What do you got going on? Yeah, we're we're real big on the Disney Plus thing that's uh pretty much taken over at our house when you've got three kids under six you uh you don't get to watch what you want to watch ever so, so it's uh you know we i i do pretty much all of our cooking i have to be on a pretty strict diet because if i get off my diet i gain weight like no like no one else so i always have to stay pretty strict on the diet uh work out with my with my trainer so uh Quarantine's been pretty good. I've been able to work out with my trainer for the most part, uh, pretty much the whole time. So it hasn't been too bad. So when you say strict on your diet, are you a keto guy? Do you eat any starches at all? Can you ever just pull into a drive-through and get eight tacos and be cool with the tortillas, or do you stay lean with fish and chicken and, and low starch? 
Yeah, I'm pretty much my diet consists of chicken, fish, and deer meat. And that's pretty much what uh, what I work with with vegetables. So that's that's pretty much what I'm going with. I have to uh, I have to make some different stuff for the wife. She gets kind of tired of the the same meals all the time. But uh, hopefully, it's just kind of what we have to do until uh, until this whole thing's over. Did I hear you just in some sort of fashion in so many words, Jed Jorko, just challenge me in a cook off too? Like, did you just say you're a good cook? <laughs> Are we going to hey, throw I, down I, on I, the Traeger too? Hey, I, I do all the cooking for the family, so I, I have been known to uh, to fire up the grill and make make a pretty good meal. From time is to Jorko time. is that Greek or what kind of name is Jorko? Hung- Hungarian. Hungarian. So do you do you cook uh, table fare that would be relevant to Hungary? No, not, I don't even. I couldn't even tell you what's known and hungry to eat. Like, I'm not sure what they're really known for. I think pierogies, maybe. I think they're big pierogies. on the pierogi thing, which obviously I can't eat one of those. For either of me, I would gain like five pounds if I ate one. Oh yeah, there's no doubt. That's kind of like being in Pittsburgh and having one of those uh, those gyros or whatever with all the the lamb meat's awesome, but then they smoke it with all that sauce and it just destroys it. But yeah, kind of the same concept, I think. So if you and the wife get a babysitter, if mom or dad are in town, grandparents are in town, you got a night out and there's a concert in town. It's an outdoor amphitheater. What band does Jed Jorko want up on that stage? Um, if it was me, I'd probably right now, I'd probably pick Luke Combs. He's, uh, I really like what he's, what he's throwing out there. I'm a, I pretty much only listen to country music. So uh, it's going to be some kind of country. Maybe, uh, I would go listen to maybe some, some old George Strait. I would, I could go for something like that. Now, would you enjoy the Zach Brown band? Cause I've been to them in Virginia before I've been to them in DC. I've seen them all over that area up there in the, the, the Atlantic, the Northeastern part of the country the eastern part of the country are you a zach brown fan yeah yeah i like i like i like his music yeah he's uh he's been doing it he's he, they like all these guys they're all throwing some good stuff out i can just go and chill and drink a beer and hang out and listen to music anytime but the question is jed jorko are you a bro country guy because luke combs is on the radio today which is tough to do being traditional country and he is doing duos with with brooks and dunn and he is throwing around songs that are hitting people because he's so re- he's so reachable, he's so touchable, he's so clever with his songwriting. I just had a podcast the day before yesterday with Ray Fulcher, who's written a lot of songs with Luke, and he wrote the um, one of his biggest hits. You know, the one about the Hooters parking lot and the waitress call picking up on the first ring and leaving her number on yeah. the check and all that. Well, Ray helped Luke write that, but he's got something going on that's not bro country, in my opinion. Are you a Florida Georgia line guy, or are you a Hank Sr. guy, or would you say that you just like music in a good time, or could you kind of have a chip on your shoulder about some of the, what I would call the fake country music? Yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm more of like, the 90s were way better than now, I would go like along those lines. Um, but, you know, if it's, it's a good song, I, I'm not going to judge anybody. So you would take a night like this, Travis Tritt, Tracy Lawrence, Mark Chestnut, Sammy Kershaw, and Joe Diffie over yes. Florida Georgia Line and some of the cats running today like I would, right? Yeah, like I like 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 Al Dean like five years ago better than Al Dean now. It's kind of kind of like along those lines. Yeah. What is that hat you're wearing if you don't have? Is that a diamond? Uh, is that a what Evo is that? shield? What is that? That's a baseball training device? No, yeah, it's uh, like the shin protectors, the wrist protectors. They've kind of uh, taken over. They uh, come into the clubhouses every year, bring us uh, our equipment we need because I fouled a ball off. When I was in AAA, I fouled a ball off my shin and I pretty much broke it. And uh, oh. ever since then, I went straight to the Evo Shield and they've taken care of me. So what I would like you to do after this podcast, Jed Jorko, is call your contact at Evo and tell them that you need every piece of protective gear for you to wear during our ping pong game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll back out for sure. I'll, uh, I'll get a face protector too. It sounds like this backhand you've got might be serious. So, uh, are you, you, you going to put that on over your mask? Cause you're going to have to wear a mask. You're going to have to control your breathing, dude. Yeah, that's, that, that might be a tough, that's a good point. Let's, uh, let's wait until this is all over and uh, forget about the mask. I'm really going to, I'm really looking forward to that game. So country music, you love deer hunting. You love, are you a duck hunter at all? That's what we do. Kind of, um, ish we're duck hunter ish. Are do you enjoy being in the duck blind or are you mainly a tree stand guy with an air, a bow and arrow? What do you like? Yeah, I've, I've never gone duck hunting. It's not really, it's not what we do in West Virginia. There's not really anywhere to, to go and really do duck hunting. Uh, you know, 
I just bought property, planning uh, planning some food plots in a couple of days. So that's kind of been taking over my time, which has been awesome uh, for the deer. And I actually got to turkey hunt uh, this year for the first time because I'm usually never home. And uh, you would have been impressed the first time I put that uh, mouth turkey call. This was the first time I ever used one. I'm pretty sure I could have called in a duck. That's what it sounded like. Yeah, or a coyote. Did a coyote come running in because uh, he thought it was a dying rabbit? Yeah, it was not good. Just a bunch of squeals and it was bad. But by the end, I got him to gobble by the end of the season. So that made me happy. Yeah, I was, I'm buddies with the guy. Do you know the Bone Collector crew, the Michael Waddell? Yeah, yeah. so, yep. so Michael was on here the other day and it, we just launched it yesterday, the podcast. And we had a, him and I had a, a Instagram social media turkey call off where I challenged him on, uh, you know, cause I'm competitive. So I just talked a little smack and he's one of the best there is in my opinion. So I just went on there and said, and I'm using his calls, the new bone collector turkey calls. And so I challenged him and I said, Hey, what, what, what'd you think of our challenge during the podcast? He goes, brother, he goes, that gobble you do is good, but the rest of your calling needs a lot, a lot of work. <laughs> and he just started, just started <laughs> roasting me on just the, really on the podcast. Hard. But that's the thing about turkey turkey calling is that the the diaphragm and being able to control your mouth cavity and your tongue and the pops on it and doing that, I, I, I have it down to where I can do it and get the right sounds. But then when I listen to guys that really sound authentic and legitimately like a turkey, I'm nowhere near the hens that they're producing. But you don't have to, that, doesn't, that doesn't stop me from calling in turkeys, you know, they're, as long yeah. as you're not, you know, a, a mess out there, you still have a chance. Yeah, if you're not butchering it too bad, you can still you can still pull one in from a little bit. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, did you? What happened on your turkey hunt? What was the end result? Um, well, I mean, there's a group of us that gone. It was kind of a tough year, actually, which is uh, kind of what the word has been around our whole area. But we were we were still able to get four four on the ground, which is pretty good. We uh, we had a, a my buddy had a death in the family. It kind of put a halt to. Uh, to the season for a week but uh other than that we we were able to get out there and just i think just even just going out with some buddies is uh is worth it even if you don't get anything and are you an archery deer hunter yes love it so i i have this other thing like kind of like my mindset i'm kind of i'm not trying to be i'm not ignorant but i'm very opinionated in some aspects like i i would tell anybody in the world that baseball players are the best athletes in the world and i would tell everybody that you should not shoot a turkey with a bow. And when I talk to people about it, I get a little bit of pushback from certain individuals, one of them being one of my good buddies, Chad Mendez from the UFC, who I'm working on this cookbook project with. He loves archery hunting turkeys. And I say that, no, you're not, they're meant to be shot with a gun. With your skills as an archer and your love for deer hunting and your crossover now into the turkey woods, do you agree with me on that? Do you feel like it's only should be gun or are you cool with a bow out there? Um, I think if you're good enough that you're not going to do more damage than good, then I think it's all right. But, uh, you know, I, I took a, I took a gun with me, but I, that was the first time I'd ever turkey hunted. I didn't want to, I didn't want to take the chance, but, uh, you know, when it comes to deer hunting, I kind of feel like it's way more intimate, way better, way closer with a bow. But, uh, with, a, with turkey hunting, I, I took, I had a gun. I think it would be cool to shoot one with a bow, but, uh, I, I don't want to take that chance. Yeah, I'm just, I just got a weird chip on my shoulder about it. But okay, back to something that's more relevant than archery turkey hunting. Were you irritated with the news that came out of Houston last year with the antics that were being lived out down there? Or were you kind of just like, it is what it is, it's going to happen here and there? Or was it a big deal that they were taking, you know, that in, you know, they were kind of cheating they were cheating so is it a big deal to you when that happens or are you allowed to talk on that does your agent call you and your pr rep and say yo chill or are you allowed to voice your opinion about how that is bad for the game and the culture of baseball yeah i I've, I've never really talked too much about it because i don't know the full details because i don't want to say someone did this when they didn't stuff like that but uh the only thing i say if you're if you're on second base and the catcher's giving signs and you're relaying it through that way, I think that's perfectly okay. I don't feel like that's cheating. I feel like that's just gaining an advantage and playing the game of baseball. That's kind of how it is. But if someone's wearing a buzzer or you're getting info from a computer or something like that, then that's, uh, that's definitely wrong. And I, I feel like uh, if that's what they were doing, the penalty should have been harsher. But like I said, I, I'm not exactly sure what was going on. I didn't look too much into it. Uh, that's not my job. So if, if they were using buzzers and stuff, it should be a lot worse. 
But if, uh, and, you know, if the pitcher's tipping his pitches and the catcher's not giving good signs and you're getting, you're trying to figure out what pitches they're going to throw that way and then you're going to let a guy know, then I'm perfectly fine with that. If you're laying in bed, National League first, is there a pitcher that keeps you up at night that you know you're getting to face the next day? I'm not saying that you're scared of any fastball, even being brushed back. I know that you can hit the off speed. I know that you can hit the the breaking balls. Is there a pitcher that makes you second guess your talent level as far as your approach that you're going to take that next day because he is just that legit on the mound? I mean, there's a lot of guys like that, but I've I've always struggled with Zach Greinke. He's uh, when I was in San Diego, he was he was in L.A. Uh, I faced him probably 30 times, and for whatever reason, I just I can't get a hit off of him. It's it's mental now. I know it. He's in my head, and I hate that about him. Uh, so he I struggle against him. I think the last time I faced him, I did get a hit. So I think I'm maybe one for 30 off of him now. So. Uh, Hopefully I don't ever face him again and I can just say that I owned him for the last time I faced him. Does he know that and does he talk smack at all or does he ever does he ever just give you a little bit of insight that he knows he's got you? No, I don't think so. I no. I don't talk to him a whole lot. Um well, I don't I don't What, really what about Max? Before. What is Max? What do you think of Max? How do you approach facing him? Scherzer? Yeah. Um I've got, I've gotten a little bit of success off him, not a ton. I did take him deep back in my rookie year, so that was cool. Um, but he's he's just the ultimate competitor. I, that's what I love about him. He's the he's gonna come right at you. So that's that's what I really like. I like guys that are gonna challenge me. Uh, bring bring your best stuff, and then see what happens. Okay, now if you answer the same question in the American League, is there a guy over there that you want to face because you know he's legit, but you want to see what you would do against him? Um, I haven't, I've never faced Verlander too much. Uh, I've, I've always respected his, the way he pitches, the way he attacks guys. Uh, I faced him a couple of times, but not very much. Um, I always enjoyed facing Garrett Cole when he was in Pittsburgh. Now he's, I don't face him hardly ever in New York, but, uh, you know, you, you just want to face the guys that are the best in the league. That's, uh, that's what kind of gets us up in the morning, gets us ready to play is to go out there and compete against the best guys in the world. Have you watched um, any of the show? Gosh, dang it! Now I'm forgetting the name of it. It's on, it's on a the FLC or something network, and it's about a Triple A AAA announcer that becomes the commissioner of baseball. Is this ringing a bell at all? George Brett was a guest star last season. Amanda Peets is no. co-star in it. No, I, oh I, man, I, you got it. If it's not on Disney Plus, I probably haven't haven't caught too much of it. Okay, well then forget that question. Hopefully it comes to my mind because I want you to you got to check it out, man. It's got so many like cool uh, like baseball references. I mean, it's all about baseball, but season one was better than season two. What if you have to watch a baseball movie? Do you go the route of? Are you a comedy guy that likes the major league and the Bull Durham, or does it have to be filled of dreams? Is it Sandlot? What is your baseball movie of choice? Uh, I love the major league movies. Oh God, uh, I'm so glad you said that. I'm, and I'm so happy that like, Bob Euchers our announcer now, and I got to spend some time with him uh, in spring training, and he is every bit as funny just sitting at a table in the clubhouse as he is on those movies. He, he's unbelievable. It's awesome. God, he, I don't, who gives a shit? It's nobody's <laughs> listening anyway. Like his Harry Doyle, right? That was his name in major yeah, league. Yeah. 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 He's a uh, man. He, he has, he likes to have a good time. He's, he's awesome. Artie, Artie Lang. Has that name ring a bell to you? The comedian that used to be the co-host of the Howard yeah. Stern show. Yep. There's a story out there that you might be able to YouTube about how he was called into the booth. I think the brewers were playing, the dime, I think it was in Phoenix, but he got called up into the booth with Bob Euchre. And he said that watching Bob work the mute button and putting his hand over the mic and the stuff that he would say when he would see somebody <laughs> in the audience or the crowd, he, he would mute it real quick. And then he would turn it back on and be like, the two out pitch coming. And he's, and then he, he would mute it real quick and he'd say something about somebody in the audience. And, and, and Artie Lang said it was freaking hilarious to watch the man work. Yeah, it's uh man, he he's a really funny guy. It's uh it was a good time. Yeah, man, that's just like that 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 whole 
that whole Charlie Sheen and the, you, you know, we wear caps and sleeves in this league, son. Don't know. <laughs> California Penal League and all. Like the in Wesley Snipes' character. Shit, I've been red tagged already. Like <laughs> that whole deal. It was just, I, I, I tell everybody, it's the best. And I don't know about two. Two was okay. Three, whatever. But number one, I'm talking like they, they got, you know, when they're in the French restaurant and he's like, they got chili dogs over there. And, yeah. and Rene Russo's character, did you read Moby Dick? And he's like, cover to cover, babe. Like the whole movie is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I, yeah, the, the first two are awesome. And then it's, they kind of, I was off of it after the, the well, they kept trying to do it more and more. But the, the first two are, yeah, the, hilarious. See, the guy in, in part one that plays first base for the Yankees, I believe was a brewer. Pete Vukovic and I used to have all of his baseball cards. I think it was Vukovic that ended up playing that part of the big dude with the mustache. I think he was a Milwaukee yep. brewer for Parkman. a lot of them. Parkman, yeah, right? Parkman, yeah. And I think he was a brewer for most of his playing career. If I I think that was Pete Vukovic. It looked just like him anyway. I don't know. I didn't, yeah, I had no idea, but I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up when we're done for sure. I had no yeah, idea look it up. That. I think I did it one time and I might be off, but I remember watching it the first time and God, I think that was made in like eighty nine, probably the year you were born, huh? Eighty eight, yeah. Eighty eight. So I think that movie was eighty eight, eighty nine. Had to have been around there, yeah, pretty close. Yeah, I'm 40. I was born in 74. So I was, uh, I was like 15 or 16 when it came out and it was freaking, I loved every minute of it, man. I, I, I like Bull Durham a little bit. I think it's a good movie, but I, it's just something about the major league trilogy. You know, the first two, like you're talking about, I love them. So what, what's, what's next? I mean, are you just waiting every day? Are you, are you in a position to where you have a yard there locally that you go out and have somebody hit you fungos? Are you getting to run poles? Are you getting in a cage? Are you in a tunnel? Are you getting to hit live on the field? Are you uh, behind an L screen? Is it soft tossed? You got some arms there that can challenge you a little bit. What do you, how are you training? Yeah, we've, uh, my facility is opened up now. So I've been, uh, you know, it's got, it's where I work out. My, my trainer, he works there. So it's his gym. So I go there and, uh, do all my lifting there and then straight into, they have a hundred yard indoor turf field. So I catch there. I got a guy that I've been working with for, this is, uh, this is year 26. I've been working with, I started working with him when I was five. He still hits me ground balls. He still throws BP to me. And we just, we've just been getting after it. So uh, I feel like, uh, the advantage of having that building has been big for me. I feel like it's kind of kept me a step ahead in this whole thing. So I, if, and when we get back together, I feel like uh, I should be a little bit further along than the other guys. How, how many local articles in the local paper or local news stations have covered you? And what's this man's name that you've been with since you were five? His name is Jerry Mahoney. Is he a local celebrity because he's coaching the, all uh, the, the studs in the show? Um, he's, he's been doing baseball like this forever. He actually, I have two older brothers. Um, he worked with them when they were younger. So he's been doing this for 50 years and he, he actually played at West Virginia for two years, uh, back in the seventies. So he's just a guy that's been around that loves baseball and, uh, can just throw BP nonstop until his arm falls off. It's, uh, it's pretty cool that we've been able to do this for this long. So is he kind of like you're the Mike Tyson and he's custom motto to where if he watches you play on Sunday night baseball or he's got the Fox package, the regional package, does he text you and say you're opening your hips, you're flying open, you're dropping your elbow, you're, 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 you're you know, you're coming unglued a little bit and unhitched or is he giving you hints throughout the season when he's watching you on the TV? He has, he, he, he doesn't like to say too much. He kind of, he understands how difficult it is, but uh, if I'm really struggling, he'll, you can tell he get, he's getting frustrated and he'll, he'll shoot me a text or give me a call and tell me to, to clean my shit up. So uh, it's uh, he, he's, I get it honest from him. There's no doubt about that. What is the worst slump Jed Jorko's ever been in? Have you ever been O for 50? No, I think I had just gotten, I gotten hurt my rookie year. And I had just gotten off the DL and I came back too soon. I thought I was ready. I thought I felt good. I went like, I think it was like one for 30 or something like that. And it felt like I hadn't got a hit in like four months. It was miserable. How do you come out of this? And I want you to transition the answer to that into talking to a 16, 17 year old kid. That's a junior going into their senior year. <clears throat> sucks what the seniors just had to endure it sucks that the juniors didn't get to try to compete for a starting job of that of this year and they they missed a lot of ab's they missed a lot of live at baseball everybody's in the same boat what do you tell a guy a kid that young that loves the game 
that has the ability, um, he's competing at the high school level and he's getting some, you know, looks at the, at the college ranks, no, no major league scouts around yet or cross checkers or anybody, but do you tell him certain things to work on? Or is there an overlying message that you've been taught by your guys of how to approach this game that is so freaking difficult, not just physically, but so mentally can beat you up. One for 30 feels like you haven't got a hit in 120 days. What do you tell somebody that wants to be to where you're at, Jed, as a starting infielder on a major league ball club, making a good living and loving life with your family? Yeah, I, the thing that I always come back to is I try to make sure they're still having fun because this game is so hard and they can just I mean, just beat you down, beat you down into the ground to where you think you can't move. And I think the most important thing is to remember, it's still a game. It's still a game. You're supposed to have fun. Um, just trust your ability. That's the the main thing. When you get when you get to the big league level, we, we all know that we're really good. We know we're the best of the best. We just got to trust and know that, that mentally that that's we're here for a reason and that we know that we can get hits. But uh, like, like I said before, I, I when I'm really struggling, I just try to go back to make sure I'm having fun playing the game, not beating myself up too much because the game's hard enough how it is. So how do you have fun when you can't hit the ball? <laughs> uh, you might want to talk to your teammates in the clubhouse a little bit more, talk about something other than baseball. Uh, you know, I take my kids out somewhere. I'll go do something with them just to kind of get my mind off of everything. And then uh, I show back up to the field ready to go. It's a, it's a great thing about baseball. What you did yesterday, it doesn't matter. You get, you're starting with a fresh – fresh slate the new the next day and uh just get after it that day one day at a time out of these five players who do you want to have a conversation with right now at this point in your career george brett kirby puckett if he was still alive ken griffey jr hank aaron alex rodriguez uh, I would probably pick Hank Aaron. I, I've, I've spoke to Griffey before. I mean, not a lot, but I, and I've spoken to A-Rod before. Um, so I, I guess I'd pick Hank Aaron, just, you know, the home run King. What I would probably more talk to him about how it was just playing when he did, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of a tough time for African-American players and for him to kind of go through that and, uh, to be as good as he was is, uh, that's pretty remarkable. And this, the, the, as long as he played, I'm not sure how many seasons he played, but it, was definitely into the twenties. Um, just how he uh, had that longevity. Tell me what your respect level is for somebody like George Brett. Twenty years with the same organization, Silver Sluggers Awards MVP, World Series champion in '85, and three batting titles in three different decades. Like that is to me like obviously the timing has to match up, but to win one in '76, one in '80, and then one in '90. How freaking good and polished do you have to be with your skill set to do something like that? Yeah, that's that's incredible. And still only to be known for getting called out for having your pine tar up too high on a home run, which is which was awesome the way he came out of the dugout. But uh, he played with my first manager, Buddy Black, in San Diego. And, you know, Buddy had nothing but great things to say about him. So uh, obviously anyone that can hit like that and play the way he did, you got to respect the, respect the hell out of that. God, I love the way he played. And – the pine tar incident. Um, I got a, a personal story. I'll tell you that off record, but it's a, that's a pretty cool little story there. And then Bud Black and him are still great friends. That's like one of his best friends in the game. Is he the, yeah. still the manager of Colorado? Yeah. 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 He yeah, was he my got, first man. He was my first manager in San Diego way back when his, uh, his wife actually took my wife to the airport when we had our twins. Oh, really? So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they'll always be close to us. All right, so we got we said a lot today. We talked a little bit of smack. You know that I'm doing it in a fun way. I got nothing but mad respect for what you've accomplished. But I really do want to do this cornhole. I want to smoke you in ping pong. I might even drive you to the bowling alley and show you, you know, if unless you need bumper lanes, I'll probably get probably 231 to 140, somewhere in there. I would beat you by 100 <laughs> pins almost. It's, I mean, that's pretty fair to say. I want to have a little Olympic thing against a major okay, leaguer and see how I run. Yeah, I, w- I just want to see where I rank in some of this stuff. Back backyard barbecue decathlon. Yeah, I think that we we do a cook off. We figure out a few different wild game meats and one domestic meat. We got to pair it with a vegetable. We have to serve that, and the presentation is going to be counted as well as the internal temperature, the flavor, the overall meal. Then we move into some of the athletic events. 
and then we might um, figure out the last part of the challenge might be something to where neither one of us know anything about it. We've like playing a guitar. I don't know if you know how to play guitar. I don't, but maybe we pick up no. something that's an instrument or, you know, something, maybe it's a turkey call. We have a turkey call challenge, a duck call challenge, or maybe something to where, you know, I don't do it. You don't do it. We'll just figure something out. And then that'll be the final part of our, our Olympic decathlon. I'm in without you're, a doubt. You're sure. And I'm, I'm going to beat you. Have you ever cooked on a Traeger? Uh, no, no, I don't even know what that is. Really? A Traeger. Yeah. Look it up when we get off here. T R A E G E R. It's right. a, it's a wood pellet convection grill. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll get your address and I'm going to send you a little prize package for being on the, a little, a little thank you package for being on the podcast. Even so though I get a Traeger, right? That's what I'm saying. Oh, all right. Sweet. I'm going to, I'm going to, I am going to make your wife, because I don't want to like beat you up in all of these athletic events and have her be like, really, honey, I want you to be like, honey, just taste this food right here off this Traeger. Yeah. Look, look what we got. This is all <laughs> worth it. This right here is worth it. This was all worth me flying out to Nevada and getting smoked 21 to 14, three games in a row. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I appreciate you being on. We got to do this again once the season starts. We'll do it sometime in the season when you're when you're hitting close to 400 and you're getting a couple three for fours back to back to back. See, so probably 21 bombs in a 80 games. No, 70 games, 21 bombs. Heck you're not. Yeah, you say you're not running very well. You're not running very well right now. You said so. You're probably not going to be in the SB column. Yeah, that, we'll leave that to the younger guys, the younger faster guys, the younger faster guys. We, we guys like guys like me drive those guys in. So it's Friday night, but you're in West Virginia. If I'm in Milwaukee on a Friday night, I'm looking for the best fish fry in town. Um, the fish fries of the walleye are unbelievable in Milwaukee, all over heard, that part of the I've country. Heard, yeah. yeah, I've been to I've several of awesome. them. I've been to several of them all over Milwaukee and Green Bay. You will absolutely love those. Um, and there's some great hunting up in that area too. So, um, but plan on, plan on meeting me sometime in November, December, January timeframe before you need to report for spring training and we'll get after some ducks and geese and maybe we'll get Charlie Blackman out there with us and a couple other guys. Heck yeah, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll be watching for it. I can't wait for the season to start. I hope nothing but the best for you, brother. I'll be in touch. I'll text you and get your address. Thanks, man. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. This has been another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast. Y'all follow the Milwaukee Brewers, Jed Jorko, an absolute stud. What a great dude. Thank y'all for listening to another podcast today brought to you by our friends at Oakley. Protect your eyes, protect your vision, see the future. I hope it's bright. Stay home, stay safe, be a provider, take care of them kids, take care of your loved ones. I'm Chad Belding. Appreciate you. Tom, hit that button. This is Leith Lofton. What you going to do when the money's all gone? We're all equal. That's what I think. I don't believe heaven has a bank. Make-